introduction of myself. My name is Lisa Famularo, and I am one of the coaches in the Center for Career Development here at UConn. Um, in my role, I meet with a lot of students one-on-one -on -one to talk about their career goals, and I specifically focus on students who are looking to become this year at UConn. So probably that includes a lot of you in the room. Um, and I talk a lot about different careers in the field of healthcare, which is kind of part of the inspiration for today's event called Pathways to Healthcare. Um, because I'm sure we all know, you know, med school is one way to get there, but there are other options, and that's kind of what we're here to talk about today. Some other career paths that don't require med school that can still be really rewarding and um, make you very successful in the field of, of healthcare. Um, I hope you grabbed a copy of the program on the way in. If you haven't, there is a stack back there if you want to go grab one. Um, but we're going to start out with uh, just a brief five, seven minute presentation from myself about careers in healthcare in general. And then I'm going to turn it over to our panelists to answer your questions about working in the field. Um, how they chose what to do with their careers, um, any advice that they would have for you, and things of that nature. And I would like to just have our panelists introduce themselves now at this point, just so that you can get started maybe thinking about your questions um, while the presentation is going. So um, if you don't mind, Heather, would you mind getting us started with introductions? Mm -hmm. My name is Heather McHugh. I'm a talent sourcing specialist for Harvard Healthcare. So basically, I place people in jobs who have not applied yet for home care services, as well as um, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and language Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie Lipchak. I am currently a program coordinator at the Help Me Grow National Center, which is a national program that links families to services and it currently exists in over 30 states. Um, and the Help Me Grow National Center was created by a pediatrician at Connecticut Children. So we are still there and we are um, housed within the Office for Community and Child Health. Hi, I'm Maggie Dalo. Um, I am a part of the to answer your questions but there's a bunch of different options in the video your questions yeah all right so definitely think about that um, and start start drumming up your questions now but i'm going to go ahead and get started with um the presentation portion of the evening um which is some of the topics that i'm going to cover to give you a heads up are i'm going to talk about med school a little bit because i know that's definitely something that's talked about a lot in terms of health in the field of health care um we're going to also talk about or buckets of other occupations that you can have in the field of healthcare, um, different research resources that you can use to find out more information about those different buckets, and then just kind of summarizing that information before we pass it off on to the other speakers. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So as I'm sure many of you it can be really competitive to get into medical school in the U.S. So we know the data is there that shows that. Um, the total U.S. acceptance has been relatively flat over the past five admission cycles. And it's been around, um, you can see the numbers here, around 41, 42%. Um, and, and that, you know, is an incredibly high. Um, this is also a lot lower than what it was like 20 or so years ago in the 2000s, where it was closer to 45%. So we are seeing that the rate is kind of slowly decreasing over time. And personally, that's kind of led me to ask the question, why? Why is that? So um, I did some research and find, found out some of the main reasons, at least according to the internet, that um, all of this is happening. And some of them are listed here. So first of all, there's an increased volume of applicants. More people want to go into healthcare, so more people want to go into med school in general. Um, and some of the reasons for that are that they people want to have a career that's going to help other people. And one of the first options you often think of, if that's the case, is going into healthcare, which makes a lot of sense. The reasons are that you can have a positive impact on society. You can make a lot of money as a doctor. It's, it's definitely true. Um, but there are some other reasons as well. The number of seats available at medical schools has not increased that much in med school. So, you know, they only have so many seats in their labs, in their rotational programs, in their residencies. And therefore, as the number of students who are applying have increased and that number is staying the same, that's one of the reasons why we're seeing that. Um, we're also seeing that high schools and colleges are doing a better job of introducing the STEM fields um, in, while you're in high, middle and high school. So that way you're more interested in 
those fields. So therefore, the competition is increasing a little bit as well. Um, and as I mentioned, US residencies have sort of created a bottleneck in the medical school supply chain because that's a required component of your ability to pass to become a physician. Um, and if there are not enough residencies available, then not everybody can obtain a residency. So these are some things to think about. And I want to hone in specifically on the idea of um, having that desire to help people or to have a because that is, of course, a reason to go to medical school, but there are a lot of other careers that can still help you have a positive impact on people or on society, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, some of those other buckets of occupations that you might want to be in. So what are the four buckets? The four that I'm going to touch on briefly today are careers in research, careers in administration and management, careers in service and clinical setting, all still within the company. Again, I'm kind of breathing through this because I want to make sure that our panelists can sort of add to this content. So if you were to pursue a career research, um, you would be doing work that is helping us as a society learn more about health and find better ways to prevent and treat disease. So a lot of you, that might be the reason why you're interested in healthcare in the first place, and doing research might be the way, besides being a physician, that you could do that. Um, healthcare research takes place in so many settings. It can be in hospitals. Be at colleges and universities, labs, insurance companies, um, and so much more because research has been happening in all of those different fields. And in terms of what careers in this field might entail, um, they might be designing studies, running trials, so actually getting to interact with patients and exploring um, different tests for um, you know, new medications, for example. Um, it also involves a lot of the time collaborating with a lot of other healthcare professionals. So you might be doing um, research for a physician or with a physician, and that way you still like, be in their office, in their practice, and get to shadow and work with them all the time, even if you're not the one who's actually treating or administering treatment to patients. So, so you can still totally be in that, in that setting. Um, so if you're the kind of person who wants to be like the body of knowledge that's kind of contributing to our healthcare system, research might be a really cool option for you. And just a couple of um, job titles that kind of go along with that. You can see here, some of these are pretty obvious, you know, associate, um, et cetera, but then there's some that you maybe might not think of, like bioinformatician or data administrator or lab tech. These are kind of all other ways that you might be able to get into that field. By the way, these I pulled um, from actively doing a job search. Like I sat down last week and pretended that I was looking for jobs. So these aren't made up. These are all actually currently open positions that you could be. Bucket two, administration and management. Um, this is a very, very broad category. And people who work in this category are generally responsible for the smooth operation of some facility or program or service um, in, in a variety of capacities. So all, all healthcare facilities, regardless of what they are, a hospital, a nonprofit, um, a private practice, need some sort of administrator. And the levels really, really vary. It could be somebody as high as a CEO um, down to somebody who's doing more of that like day-to-day -day operational stuff like administrative assistant or a client services um, representative. Um, this, these positions also can involve oversight of scheduling, facilities, finances, marketing, um, customer service, outreach, et cetera. There, there are many, I would say, traditionally business aspects incorporated into this um, area, but it's also all focused on healthcare. So at the end of the day, the patient is the, the primary person that you're working with. Um, and I think our, our panelists can probably attest to that too. You know, every healthcare professional has to have some business job in some way, shape, or form. And I think this kind of bucket gets at that a little bit. So here are some position titles that might um, correspond with that job title. We've got healthcare administrator, office manager, director, or program coordinator, um, medical biller or coder. So that's somebody who's behind the scenes working with people like you know, payment and insurance companies. So lots of different options. All right, third category, service programs. Um, so in terms of service, um, th there are service programs and there are also service-oriented jobs. In terms of service programs, that might be something where you're part of a cohort or you have like a, a certain number of year assignment with an organization, whereas a service job it might be something that you're just, it's a quote unquote regular job, but you're, you have a service orientation to your career. You're working maybe in a non with a service division of a larger organization. Um, they're usually surrounding a specific cause. So you've probably heard of organizations before like the American Red Cross or the American Cancer Society. You know, they have their mission that they're really passionate about. 
And sometimes those positions with those companies can be very business focused, but they can also be very outreach and um, you know, patient care or health oriented. Um, responsibilities can vary very widely based on the organization, um, but it can be anything from patient care to fundraising to literally anything that you can think of. But if you have a cause that you're really passionate about, going this service route might be something that's really beneficial. Um, and here are some examples of some of those programs. Like you've probably heard of AmeriCorps, City Year, Peace Corps. Those are those ones where you're, you kind of are given an assignment and have like a term of some kind. Um, and then there are also some organizations. I, I picked a couple that um, I think Adam City Reef has a presence in the state of Connecticut, um, where they are kind of surrounding a cause and you can work in a variety of different capacities for those organizations. All right, and then the last bucket is clinical bucket, which um, this is anything that can contribute to, I would say the direct or indirect treatment of patients. So of course, if, if I were to put physician in one of these categories, I would put physician in this category. Same thing with like nurses, PAs, stuff like that. Um, but this can also include people who don't necessarily have to have a medical degree to be doing some of these acts. So you could you could be directly interacting with patients, or you could be an expert on a certain exam or um, treatment, and you could be, you know, serving that specific purpose in a patient's longer trajectory of their treatment. Um, so the settings vary for this, but here are some examples, and this is probably, this is the longest list because I would say so many things fall into this category, but you can see here, you could be a medical scribe, you could be a recreational therapist, um, a, a technologist of some kind, whether it's with x-rays or sonographers or um, radiology, you know, if you're, if you're doing some sort of um, cancer treatment. So there's a lot of different options, and for those of you who what you're really attracted to about healthcare is that direct patient interaction. One of these fields where you don't have to go to school for eight to 10 years, but you can maybe go for, you know, one to, to four or five years um, might be a more appealing option to you because almost all of these have some sort of certification, but they take a lot shorter than So that was really meant to get you kind of started. Um, I also just want to throw up this search tools for the future. If you want to take a picture of this real quick, it might be beneficial for you to, to look at a little bit later. Um, these are websites that have information about a lot of different healthcare careers, and you might want to go on them to find out some of this information. So if you go home today and think, you know, I'm, I might want to explore careers in this area, or I heard this position title, but I don't know much about that, let me learn more. These are some really good sites that can, that can potentially help you with that. Um, and my personal favorite is the top one, explorehealthcareers.org, because it's really, really comprehensive, but the others all have really good So just to summarize, before I hand it over to my panelists, um, just final, final thoughts about that. Um, there are numerous paths to take in the field of healthcare beyond those traditionally thought of occupations. And one of the um, best things that you can do to help figure out which one of those occupations might be the best fit for you is think about what drew you to the field of healthcare originally. And that might open the, the door for a lot of other options for you. Um, if you do decide to choose a parallel occupation to go into that doesn't mean it's a bad thing or a failure in any way. It means that that is something that you're passionate about and you can absolutely pursue that um, instead, or, instead of or concurrently going to med school. Um, and then there are varieties of healthcare specific occupational research tools and strategies like the ones on the previous slide that can be really beneficial to you. But that's also the purpose of today's event because we're about to hear from four people who do work in some of these positions. And this is another great way for you to do some research and gather some information. So props to all of you for being here today. But just kind of to kind of summarize, those are some of the main takeaways that we're hoping to leave the event with in addition to all of the activities that we have. All right, so without further ado, I'm going to kind of reintroduce our panelists and have the conversation get started. Um, I do have, yeah. Oh, I was gonna say before we get yes. a bunch of seats as well. Oh, yes. To come in. There are a front. bunch of seats yeah. over here if you want to. <laughs> Thank you. I got it. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to get us started with a first question. Um, I also have a couple of questions that I have here. Get your questions answered too. So again, if you have questions, you're welcome to send or, or um, kind of shout them out. But I was hoping that to get started, if each of you could describe 
um, your journey from, you know, when you graduated to kind of where you are now, and what were some of those, like, key, key steps that you took to help you decide, like, how you actually got to where you are today in terms of your career journey. Um, or did that end last time? So if you want to start at this end this time, sure. Um, so, like I said, I'm Mallory. I'm in the Master's in Surgical Neurophysiology program, and it's probably a field that a lot of you haven't uh, heard about. It's a fairly new field. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are monitoring. So basically, um, as Maggie said, we work in the operating room and monitor um, spine surgeries, um, along with some vascular, a bunch of other levels. And the reason I got into this field was a physiology neurobiology and I kind of just saw it as two ways in surgery. And I didn't really want to pick one of those. I wasn't wildly passionate about the career. And um, it wasn't really like something that I kind of comes along teaching or anything like that. So I was kind of stuck because I also wasn't super passionate about research. Um, so I told professors, and this was an option that was fairly new. Um, so I've always been the surgeon. And it was a great opportunity for me thinking about what skills I could use to help with a little bit of patient care and you're helping a patient in the operating room. So it's not where you, I can focus more on what my passion is. I work with an anesthesiologist, the RNA, the medical device rep, the surgeon, the PA. So we work with a variety of other medical So having a little bit of um, a little bit of patient care, but you still get to focus on my passion. So good for me. It was a nice in between. I was also a geologist. Um, kind of similar to Mallory, I didn't really know if I wanted like a career in But at the undergrad at like high school, I learned a lot, but I wasn't anything I saw in the Um So when I came in, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I ended up being a director of the And it really just felt like all the things that I wanted to do. Um, physical, but still neuroscience. Um, and it was at the time, and it's the only master's that I could ever get. I don't know, it's crazy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so then graduation came around. I worked for a year in a behavioral neuroscience lab. Finishing that up, I um, I again, my name is Stephanie Lechak. Um, I'm gonna back all the way up to undergrad at UConn. Um, there were really two defining experiences that sort of shaped my career prospects and where I was thinking about um, going. So, um, one of those was Husky Pro involved in HuskyCon for three years and was on the management technical team. And the others, other was um, the legislative internship through the Connecticut General Assembly. And so I um, was working on some policy. I was actually a political science major. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how I ended up where I am now. Um, but I was really exposed to um, issues related to children. So I knew that both of those experiences um, Really meant so much to me, and wanted. I really wanted to focus on children's issues um, and children uh, going into my career. Um, from there, I knew that Connecticut Children's was a really fantastic organization through my work with Husky Fund. So I actually worked for um, the school that they ran, which was called CCMC School, and I was a paraprofessional for about two years, working with kids directly. Um, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, and so that felt like the right next step. Um, and in my work there, I 
really realized how much of the issues that kids were experiencing were systemic. So um, issues related to their health, their education, the trauma that they were experiencing was all related to, um, you know, not their individual um, fault or family choices. And so that really propelled me to then get my master's degree in social work to focus on child well-being at the systemic level. Um, and I did some child advocacy for the last two years, more focused on policy. Um, but I sat down and was like, man, I'm, I'm going in this direction in my career. And it really wasn't even, it wasn't that fulfilling. Um, we would get a bill passed in the legislature and there was, you know, not a lot of work being done in the administration side, um, which is really about how, you know, things on the ground are moving um, and affecting kids on the, on the ground. And so from there, I was looking really as sort of like my North Star as like an organization that I really believe in and that I have my own connections to. And I came across the Office for Community Child Health and Child Health Network. And it's really exposed my um, knowledge and interest in not just child well-being, but child health. And, um, you know, both of those are so, such critical to um, children's life outcomes and um, all of the things that affect their, their well-being. Um, and so, I'm now considering a master's in public health, but I've really been able to um, look at the, the issues that children are facing at the population health level and think about prevention and promotion and um, really looking at what we can do um, when we intervene early and parents are equipped with the tools um, need to track their children's development and know about their children's development be able to support their children in a way um, that is healthy and makes them grow up um, and thrive. And so that's really my trajectory, but I would really say that uh, my involvement in Vermont and my work with Connecticut Children's really um, propelled me into this space. And um, I continue to have ties with Lucky Thar, I just think, um, like I can't say enough good things about it. Again, my name is Heather. I'm a talent acquisition sourcing specialist. So I'm going to go back a little further than, than you. So I went back to school as an adult. My former employer paid for my education. And I was dead set on becoming an employment attorney. And so I took my last job just to kind of, you know, pay off some bills, save up some money to go to law school. And I went to my first career fair. And I realized this is where I'm meant to be. I don't want to be in a courtroom. I want to be out talking to people, helping people find jobs. The reason for that is my first attempt at college, I was actually academically dismissed with a 0 0.06 GPA. I went back to school as an adult and graduated with my master's with a 3.97. I figured if people can give somebody a second chance to go back, they can really excel. You may not find it the first time around, but you can find it the second time around. With my former employer, I didn't get to go to as many career fairs and do that as much as I really wanted to. And then I started looking into Harvard Healthcare and I figured, I want to get a company that's going to give back. Even if I, I could never be a nurse, I could never do anything like that, I see blood and I pass out. <laughs> but if I can get jobs for people who want to do things like that and be in that field, then that's where I'm meant to be. And just um, to kind of piggyback off of that a little bit, um, one of the things that you all kind of touched on is that you were considering higher education, but also some of you did work before you pursued higher education and high school specifically. So when bachelor's level careers versus pursuing higher education but not med school versus pursuing med school like how did you kind of weigh all those factors um for the three of you and then in particular in your role as a recruiter um how do you kind of look at those three different ed education levels that you're recruiting for um and do you have any advice like kind of along the lines um, that you're thinking about i think it really depends on the position to be quite honest with you um when i'm looking for physical therapists it's an automatic we need a doctor so there's no question with that. With a visiting home nurse, then um, we'll take ASN or BSN. So it really depends on the position. Um, my recommendation is, depending on the position, you want to get at least your bachelor's. And then going forward, if it doesn't require a master's, then there's really to get one. Try to find an employer that will pay for it. That's what my former employer did. They paid eight grand a year for me to go to school. So I paid for two classes out of pocket. So try to do that route, but really just look at the qualifications and 
the continued learning. So if it's not even college, but if they offer classes for you to go to or workshops, things like that, just do that. Um, keep yourself learning because you can never be too old to learn something new. And keep yourself on top of changing times. Technology has changed the workplace drastically from when, even when I graduated, and I'll date myself, that was 2001. People are completely different than they are now. So you just want to just stay up with the times and see, and if credentials change, not grandfathered in, take out the student loans and go back. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> when you were considering like bachelor's level yes, jobs okay, versus yes. higher education. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, because I was like really ambivalent and not sure where I wanted to take my career, I thought that it was best to get a job and work for a few years. Um, and I'm really glad that I took that route because I think it really shaped um, you know, my experience and really drove me to like what I'm passionate in and like what I was seeing. I think I really would have never like guessed to really focus on these systemic issues without seeing it firsthand. Uh, so that, that was really great. Um, and I would also advise that if you're considering like higher level education, like a, a master's degree or further, to really just feel like set on that, like feel like it's really going to advance your career. Um, I was working in a bachelor's level position and I knew I wanted to broaden my career prospects and I was ready for that. That's why I took the plunge. Um, and then again, if, if an employer will, um, you know, give you tuition assistance for additional education, I think that's fantastic. Um, many employers are starting to do that. So added benefit of getting the work experience filling out additional Um, so, for example, like I'm in the master's program, and you don't necessarily need a master's degree. Um, what you you only need a bachelor's um, background in neuroanatomy. Um, but what happens is they hire you or an in-house program or like other insurance companies, and then there's on how to deal with it. Um, so that was obviously an option when I was deciding what to undertake in my um, field. But I really like the idea of working with people because A, it's like a totally different outlook or experience. Um, better options for jobs and career advancement. Everyone brings a lot to the table. Um, and also like if you can get into the field, it's like a lot more than you would be getting in school. Um, just because I think that can be an intensity, uh, you know, when you're in the operating room, you have to be um, it's, sometimes you get out early, sometimes you don't balance it out, but sometimes it can be very intense. Uh, so I like the idea of it kind of integrated into a different life. Um, also, I like the idea of just getting a pitch in general because something that was always on my mind is communication. Um, so I think that for a lot of whether you're in um, this, the field of infrastructure monitoring is going to be really important. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to setting I had no experience at all so I it was good to ease into it being in the environment is and new people are new experiences so um, the clinical and experience was very very valuable to me um, it also depending how you take it into the field depending on the well is the same as monitoring or yeah, a master's degree is very invaluable because you can work a bit higher up in the field. And however, if you kind of just want to jump into the field to get a might be a better idea to take a 
hired by a company, trained for maybe like a year, get that experience. Later in high school. Being in just in the operating room with all these different people is just great. It's like it's the first time where I'm like seeing the team and I can see what a surgical day does, which I never thought was. I I just I don't heard of that before. So I guess I was like, oh that's really cool. They're actually like hands on like in the also medical device or from the room. Just what everyone else does. Um, great way to just immerse yourself into the healthcare field and see what you're responsible for move through the system of operating in the real world. So one theme that I just noticed from all four of your answers is kind of that your your exploration journey and your final decision to come to the university when you graduated you job or you took on um, a, a first program that you're going into, but you do have like a longer tail down the road, so it doesn't necessarily like what you do right after college have to be your final goal and choice to make sure you 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 keep in mind because I think it sometimes does feel like you know what I do when I graduate is kind of what it's gonna be like from now on. <laughs> yeah. You're all laughing which makes me feel good. <laughs> that means I'm right. Okay. Um so I I want to pause here up to the floor. Did anything anyone said so far spark any questions for anyone? Really depends on your position, patients are, and what you're actually be doing. You know, you have a team of six, and you want to have those medical people. Those are the position you're applying to. Yeah, I think that neither of them are limiting. Yeah. Um, I think that they'll both set you up for success. I can add to that question. Um, besides maybe your classes, what are some <laughs> other things that maybe from an employer perspective? Would be really important in application on your resume to to supplement maybe if you did or if you were good in your internship. One hundred percent internships. If you can't do an internship, volunteer work, getting a job, not at a retail store if you can, but actually in the field that you're looking to get into because you're going to have hands-on experience, be able to see just how the real world is, um, and use that to your advantage. I would agree. I think that in looking back at all of my experiences, um, you know, it really was like an internship and um, my leadership through Hudson that really sort of like grounded me even six years later. Yeah, internships are also very important as well. I don't have internships, but um, making connections. to talk to them, tell them your success, and they might help out with your dream careers, changing majors, and the career development center, I did not go to UConn. I went to Quinnipiac, and I had nothing to do with you guys have to do. Using to your full advantage, because they're going to give you things like this um, that are happening, and then just advice and networking. Um, Lisa McGuire just emailed me to contact somebody who is looking to get into healthcare and of just a conversation, a phone conversation with her, see what she's looking to do to help her post job. Just meeting Lisa and Lisa knowing me got her into having a phone screen or an interview. Yeah. Cool. Um, so a, a couple of things I'm hearing um, that I wanted to respond to. Um, I think that um, you mentioned earlier, and I think. Yeah, okay. 
and um, UConn is like such a large research institution that you have such such great opportunities to just show up and ask a professor like, hey, are you working on research? Can you learn more about your research? And also like, if you want, find a professor and, and look for them. Um, so that's what I did in grad school, and it was just a really great opportunity. I would say one one of my top that I was able to like really just get into some nitty gritty and then also a publication besides my name. Um, I would also uh, echo the importance of career services. Um, uh, I did not utilize career <laughs> services <laughs> while okay. I was here. Um, but yeah, and I, I definitely regret that. Um, it It's such a big benefit of UConn and uh, you know, just awaiting your <laughs> you know, your utilization of it. Um, so I definitely agree with that. As much as I should have, but like even now, like I see that you don't really learn too much from it. And I feel bad as the opposite. Like I should have learned more about it. I agree. Um, the resume. Okay. Um, it's happening. Looking for the um, missionary, so I'm already I'm looking for like a Added a line to that as well. Where might you look for yeah, opportunities like, and experiences like that? Yeah. I would say it depends on the university you're applying to. Um, my, so I've been in talent acquisition for three years now. Um, my job currently requires two years' experience. My last job, which I had more responsibilities, as in, like, I did acquisition, I did employee relations, I did benefits, I did the whole gamut. They took me with zero experience. Um, I had an internship, but it wasn't like at my job before that, but it wasn't really anything like a traditional one. My suggestion to you would be try to get an internship after you graduate because some of these will still accept you. They'll look for students in grad school. If you can't do that, try to get in with a company that with the type of job you're looking to get into. Start from the bottom and work your way up. And that maybe they'll be able to see that tenure that you have that you have networking and then see your strengths and be able to offer you a job. Yeah, um, I think that you have a really great question. It's a very important one. Um, and I think it's something that we like major or focus. I think it's something that you see um, a college grads or uh, grads might um, focus on or think about. So I'd say a couple of things. Um, I think that I would look at um, 
other universities, other academic institutions, um, which include like the um, Penn State universities. I think that they are um, have a lot of opportunities, maybe not as stringent as we want. Um, and I would also be flexible and just be open. Um, I think I had a clear and solid plan, and I thought I was, you know, going to be somewhere in a year or two years, and it, you know, it just completely changed so fast, um, but I wouldn't change it for the world. Um, I think that, um, you know, I really, I had to force myself to be open-minded and flexible and just sort of, like, have an overall plan, like a, a general plan and a general goal, but um, it's not necessarily going to be A to C to B. I think I learned that the hard way, but um, I I don't think I would change it. I learned so much in that. a.m. to like 11 p.m., but it's really not like that all the time. Sometimes you get there the next day, and then you're built. You do end up going to sleep, and you're probably averaging about two hours of sleep a night. Um, it's just not your I think that kind of like goes with the plan. So a little earlier when they say, oh, I don't also the next day when they but there is definitely something to it. Definitely weekends where you'll probably be on call and then you know Thursday might get added on last minute. Um, like I said, having weeks canceled. So really all of your stuff they're not gonna work you really hard every single day. Um, if you have a ten hour case one day, they probably they're bouncing you from another ten hour case the next day. So yeah it all evens Yeah, it depends, like, um, if you're in a outpatient PTA, um, it's Monday through Friday, 7 to 7. I guess it really, again, depends on the type of position you're applying for, but for administrative or in an office setting that has set hours, then yes, you're going to have a call that time afterwards. But with, like, a home care nurse, they start their day at 9 a.m., they finish their patients by, say, 2, but then they're charting until 10. So it really depends on the position that you're going for and the type of job you're In terms of GPA, like how seriously is it scrutinized when you're like applying for jobs or higher education? If you have like a built resume, it depends on the position. <laughs> well, it depends on the position. <laughs> um, for my home care nurses, because they already have experience, I'm not looking at a GPA. A, a physical therapist, they have a doctorate, there's no GPA. You know, my, if you're getting your doctorate, you need a GPA. Um, really depends, but if you're looking for like the administrative, it could be the company. Um, I really don't look at GPA, so in my former job, I um, to collect hazardous waste. There, I looked at their GPA because they're handling different waste that they need to package and transport, so they need to understand everything. So I, again, it really depends on the job. Um, that's why you need to bulk up your resume as well. So if you're telling me that you have a 2.9 GPA, you're not in any class, you're not working, just going to class and going home to me, that doesn't really show good work ethic. And if you have a 3.9 or a 4.0 and you have nothing else going on, still, what else could you be doing? So I, I think it's having that balance of work, of school, that is going to make you more well-rounded as opposed to somebody else. Um, I'll add from my perspective, I've worked now for... Um, Two different companies. Um, both are nonprofits, but neither of even considered GPA. Um, uh, and that's, I think.
think I have a little bit different of a understanding of that direct service clinical work, but um, it's, it's never even mentioned. Um, it's definitely been more of like resume across the board from like not just work experience, but other, other things. Um, and I would also add, um, when I did go to get my master's, uh, GPA was taken very seriously. Um, so I was definitely a little bit nervous about that because I was under the recommendation, but I do think that uh, my resume and my writing samples and my recommendations were like, balanced it out a bit. So um, just if you're looking into higher education, that is something to be um, aware of that it is going to impact the situation, but I think it is all about balance. master's program it may not be a technical degree but um, as we're interviewing and applying for jobs our right now I the interviews are a lot more important our experience is a lot more important um, it's a lot more important in terms of like where the candidate is going to be for the interview for so I think our like good feedback from our professor from other Just to supplement that from a peripheral perspective too, um, I think if you're using the interview as a really good tool, you know, if, if you if your interviewer asks you ten questions, it might be one focused on your GPA or maybe your academics, but the other um, nine are going to be focused on your experience and you know your personality and your fit. So that that does definitely show that those other experiences are going to be a lot. I don't want to say more, but a lot of weight in the interview. Uh, personally, in the um, Our personality and how well Like I said, that was a really good example. Yeah, very that's extreme. Yeah. It's very typical. Usually, that's what ends up happening is like people are looking for, and a lot of like people are looking for like a lot of like the same kind 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 of like
add on different modalities, capsular brain surgery. So I think we have time for about two more questions as a full group, um, and I see a couple of hands up. We can probably skip to three. Um, I'm going to start with just the one in the back. Yeah. Um, Hello. Um, my gut is telling me to answer the cause. Um, that feels really tied to something that you're passionate about, and I think it'll sort of broaden your opportunities. Um, and I appreciate that you picked up on sort of like my cause and my mission because I think that's, um, despite like my career path, I think that's been sort of like the, my north star. Um, everything that I've done and focused on and will continue to do. Um, and it just, uh, all of my experiences have really propelled me um, to focus more on it. Um, so I started out working with kids, but I think it, it really propelled me to focus on, you know, systemic injustices. But um, yeah, so I would really just say, um, you know, go with your gut. And Like we were saying earlier, your first thing is going to be everything. So if you if you get a field like what people have in here, you can really start building your network in the field, and then that's going to open up other doors. And then you'll be able to make your second job more so um, after having a foundation in that first job. The biggest point to make on this is you're not going to land your dream job right out of college. You're not going to make seventy grand right out the door. You're going to sit in a corner somewhere. And you're gonna keep it. It's just the way of the world. Um, but it's gonna give you the experience where you want to go. I started off in retail. It took me a long time, but I got to where I want to be. And it, if I quit, I would never be here. So just no matter how horrible you think it is, it's where you're supposed to be at that time to get to where you want to be. Yeah, yeah. Because if you do two, you're that's two, and you're done. You okay. want to throw it out to as many people as possible and cast a wide net as possible. Even if it's not the exact route you want to be in, if it's for like the same company and there's two positions, try to both. Because yeah. you, you never know, one might not be available, but the mm -hmm. other one may be a better fit. And I would say um, definitely for your first job, like cast a wide net. Um, since my first job doing grad school, two jobs that I've had subsequently were through networking and getting connected. So um, I think that it sort of speaks to the power of networking and that, like your first um, job into your career, you'll be able to like expound and meet so many people. And if you're 
for higher education, that'll also set your your prospects up. But definitely for that first job, I would I would try to look at that. Um, somebody said there's yeah, start now. And I'm up. looking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go on like LinkedIn too, and like chat with people. Like I know mm -hmm. I used to work with people and like I was like, oh, I don't know what to do. And then like I'm here, so that's what it's for. And yeah. I realized that, and um, and that's a really good way to like kind of get your name out there. And like, I think that's really important. Like you said, like reaching out and like talking to people and like seeing what they're doing. Speaking of not to networking, that has to happen. Yeah. Oh, yeah, random networking, networking event. Um, and now she's one of our fans. Yes, so <laughs> it works. Yes. <laughs> All right, and I believe you had a question as well. Yeah. Okay, so my question is maybe twofold for you. Um, just like in a corporate setting, then what what makes a higher education So I wish I could answer you. We have over two thousand open positions within the network of Excel. So I cannot speak to any specific Position, um, but I'm more than I don't have my card, but I can give you my contact information. Okay. Um, but again, it really depends on the position. Um, when you're doing your resume, especially if you're doing a clinical interview, list your clinicals, your age, where they're at. Any information that you can help me see that you're different from somebody else and that you're set apart from everybody else, that's what you need to get the resume through to the interviewer or the hiring manager. Um, but we can definitely talk offline. And Offline. Um, I do want to mention that the reason we chose to have this event here and right now is actually across the hall. I'm starting it a few minutes ago. Um, there is an event, uh, a career night event going on where um, Heather and many other representatives from industry companies, a lot of whom are in the healthcare field, um, are here to talk about their organizations. So um, I know you have to run, so if you want to go over there, if you want to have direct questions with her, she is across the hall. You can visit her in a couple of minutes. Um, but um, other companies there are probably going to have some really good opportunities for you. Um, but before we leave, I would like you to give a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you so much. Um, and we have a couple minutes to hang, yeah. hang around. Okay, yeah. cool. So the three of them will stay here to answer questions. Heather will head across the hall. Yeah. 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 Um, so feel free to come on up and yeah. just start the questions. Yeah. I'm coming right